Hi everyone and welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. I am extremely thrilled to introduce my guest today, jazz pianist, educator, composer and arranger, Rosano Sportiello. He is one of the world's leading jazz piano players on the scene today, specializing in styles from Harlem stride piano to bebop to contemporary jazz. And jazz piano legend Barry Harris said of Rosano, Rosano is the most fabulous piano player I have ever heard in my life. Indeed, a master of his craft. Hear him once and you'll know what I mean. And enough said, really. So, Rosano, welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. It's my pleasure and my honor. Thank you so much for having me. I am just a huge fan. Ever since I saw a clip of you on YouTube sitting down at what seems to be a Barry Harris workshop, and you just tear into something. I think the tune was just one of those things. And I mean, please, if the audience, go and go on to YouTube and you have to see this video. It's, it's unbelievable. And so, uh, Rosanna, where do we start? Let's start at the beginning. Can you tell my audience a little bit about your background? You're obviously Italian. What was your childhood like in music? And how did you end up playing jazz? Well, I, I started relatively late because I was nine years old when I touched the piano for the first time. You know, while you hear that normally, you know, professional pianists uh, at the age of three or four, they already play, you know. But you see, in my family, I was uh, the very first one to get into music in a serious way. You know, um, like my parents, of course, they love music, but uh, no one in the family had a piano, no one in the family ever played an instrument, you see. So it was something really new. But uh, my first love with music was not uh, jazz or classical music. I was very much in love with the Neapolitan music, popular Neapolitan music, the great okay. songs... Uh, from Napoli, the south of Italy, you know, there is a tradition of great songs that go back to the 1700s, you know, and uh, and that was uh, what uh, I recall uh, was giving me goosebumps uh, as, a, as a as a little child, right. you know, and so. I wanted to play the piano to be able to to play those songs, very simple, you know. And uh, eventually we moved to a part of the little city where we lived, the Vigevano, where I was born. And the, the lady next door was a piano teacher. So I told my parents, I want to take piano lessons. And that's how it started. I did uh, only a few months with uh, this uh, lady. And then um, they put me in the local music school. Uh, conservatory and that's where I studied classical music and so that was 1983 I was nine years old and then a few years later when I was about 13 14 years old totally by accident I heard the first jazz records and I fell in love very much with the traditional jazz you know with right. the uh, Dixieland and Stride Piano, and that became uh, my main interest uh, together with classical music. And by the way, I graduated from the conservatory at 22. But, uh, you know, in those years, from the age of 14 to 22, I did uh, both things at the same time, practically, you know. And uh, I had a very smart teacher, that uh, classical piano teacher, that never try to stop me because you know back in those days it's not like today that you have conservatories with the, the jazz department uh, and everybody's very tolerant yeah in those days uh, most piano teachers they wouldn't uh, agree to see you playing anything else but classical music you know right. so but my teacher was uh, was very nice very kind to me and he let me do what i wanted what was and, your teacher's uh, name his name was Carlo Villa. Carlo Villa he passed away about 10 years ago, unfortunately, suddenly, you know. And, uh, but I'm very grateful 
to him because uh, it was, you know, when you study with the same teacher from uh, childhood until, uh, you know, you are grown up, then the teacher really becomes like a second father, you know. Right. And can I ask you, did you improvise or compose growing up? Or was that something you developed in your teenage years? You know, the, the composition thing was always interesting me also as, as a child. So I have some, at my parents' house, some music notebooks with sketches, you know. Right. Of course, they sound terrible. But, uh, but there was always the bug of composition. And I think uh, this is the, the seed that turned the later into improvisation because improvisation and compositions are basically the same thing. One is faster than the other, you know, right. like I think Duke Ellington said that uh, an improvisation is a fast composition or something like that, right. you know. So the idea of, uh, of creating music, uh, the pleasure in creating music, and I used to be very fascinated even before I, I started to really be interested in jazz. When I would see on TV jazz piano players that uh, they would improvise, you know. And I remember clearly going back to, to the music school and asking the teacher, how do you improvise? Because I, I can't believe that these, uh, these piano players, they can sit at the piano and all of a sudden hours of music <laughs> is produced, yeah. you know, like that. Yeah. So the bug was always there, I would say. How did you learn jazz while you were doing conservatory classical music? Did you transcribe things off the record and memorize things that you heard on records? Or did you engage a jazz teacher? Or did you have a mentor? How did you learn jazz in your teenage years? Yeah, I learned it uh, practically just by myself. I, I didn't have... Uh, it, I, I never had really a teacher following me in the same way I had the classical piano teacher, you know. So especially in the in the first, uh, until Barry Harris. You see, I met Barry Harris when I was already 26 years old. So I was, uh, I started playing professionally gigs when I was 17 already, you know. So I think when I met Barry, I was already formed. And so... Barry gave me uh, another, uh, how can I say, uh, big amount of inspiration because I could, uh, I could finally see very close by how the sound of a jazz piano player like Barry is produced, uh, the articulation of the phrases, uh, all these little things uh, that uh, you got experienced live because... Uh, from the records, it's always different. But uh, when I was younger, I would just uh, listen to the records and I tried to imitate. And then I would try to get hold of every possible lead sheet of uh, songs that I could find. And I would start from those uh, and then uh, trying to add elements uh, of what I thought I was hearing in the records, you know. It's been like that since then, you know. It's always... Uh, <laughs> A matter of listening to the records uh, and uh, and then comparing to the lead sheet and then come up with your own. And that's what I've been doing all the way through. You said in some interviews that you started out as a Dixieland pianist. Is that true? Yes. My first band was, uh, was a very amateurish Dixieland group in my hometown. And then uh, I met some musicians from Milan and... Uh, I started playing with another Dixieland band and then through this group then I, I met other musicians that belonged to the Milano Jazz Gang that was a very, <laughs> very acclaimed Dixieland group in Italy, semi-professional. And, uh, and uh, I started playing with them when I was 18 already. And I played with this group for about seven years. And I got the chance uh, to learn a big chunk of repertoire from Louis Armstrong, from uh, Jell Roll Morton, 
and uh, and also the so-called San Francisco style that was uh, the San Francisco revival of Dixieland with Turk Murphy and Lou Waters. So really a big repertoire of, they call it Dixieland, uh, but uh, it's really many different things uh, within that uh, denomination, you know. And that was a great school, you know. I, I always tell my students, uh, the best way to learn is to find a band that is kind enough to let you play, you know, <laughs> and then you start by assimilating their repertoire and their knowledge uh, and you'll improve uh, much faster than when you're in school, believe it or not. Uh, I'm going to jump around. Um, so one question I have for you is, did you study so-called classical theory uh, in your conservatory days, or were you a piano performance major? Did you study counterpoint, to harmony, that sort of thing? Well, when I graduated, there was no distinction in, uh, how can I say, majoring stuff like that. It was uh, done like this. You would do four years uh, of solfege and, uh, and theory together with piano, and you would start at age nine in the conservatory. Today they changed it. It's more uh, structured as a university, but back then it was not like that. It was altogether 11 years, 11. So one year that was a kind of pre preparatory. And then uh, four years of theory and solfege with piano. Then the following year, you, so fifth grade, we called it. You were supposed to take the first exam of piano, and if you were uh, good enough, you would pass, and then uh, you would start studying harmony and uh, history of music for two years. Then you would do the exams on those two disciplines, and then you would be eligible for eighth grade of piano. And eighth grade was a, a big time uh, exam because you were supposed to, pre to prepare uh, 24 preludes and fugues from the well tempered clavier. 23 etudes uh, by the uh, Gradus at Parnassum by Clementi, and then all a bunch of pieces from the Romantic uh, uh, period. So it was, was a big exam, you know, and so I did that. And then the last two years, leading to the 10th grade, uh, uh, you are supposed to prepare uh, a one-hour uh, recital program that would stretch uh, from the uh, Baroque. The Bach, yeah. Mozart, uh, yes, yeah, all the way up to the 1900s. And so I, my recital, I did the, the Appassionata by Beethoven, and then I did the, the Carnaval by Schumann, and then one Rhapsody by Brahms, and I finished uh, with the, the Bartok Suite, Piano Suite. And, uh, and then you are supposed to show uh, knowledge of two piano concertos, uh, one uh, uh, before Beethoven and another one so-called uh, modern from Beethoven on. And, uh, and that was that. And so that's what I did. Then the year after the piano graduation, I went back, studied composition. And uh, but without uh, finishing the degree in composition, because by then I was uh, 23 years old and I was playing lots of gigs uh, and I was very much in love with the uh, jazz piano more than anything else. And so suddenly I said, uh, I think it's time now to just concentrate on this, because those are the years that you are supposed to invest, uh, I think, most that you can, because those are the years that you learn the most. When you start being third years old, uh, I'm afraid that it's kind of done, you know? So you can still improve, but not as fast uh, as when you are a teenager or in your 20s. Can I ask a question about, because you did study composition a little bit, you were talking about in yes. the conservatory. Now, I've asked so many jazz musicians, great ones, and how they think, and they, it seems to be, I guess the traditional ones do think of chord symbols. I, I interviewed Terry Gibbs, who, who knew Charlie Parker, and he doesn't know anything about two, five, and the numbers, but he knows chord symbols. And I just wanted to yeah. ask you, Rosanna, what, what, when you think of jazz, you talked about 
buying lead sheets and and scores and that sort of things. How do you think in jazz? Do you think of symbols? I know Barry Harris is is has a particular way of looking at harmony, but how do you look at a chord symbols? And I want to broaden this into a larger topic. You see, that's that's the point. We go back to education, but I think that uh, was very good as a jazz piano player that I got uh, classical harmony, if there is such a thing. But I mean uh, harmony the way it's taught uh, in a classical music environment. That was very good for me because that's uh, you you are taught that uh, only through numbers, you know, and then. Uh, uh, with the experience of the jazz and chord symbols, I learned to to let those two ways uh, to merge together, you know, and so I feel comfortable with both. But uh, you see, the fact that uh, I studied uh, so much piano literature and the fact that uh, I already had in, uh, experience with the uh, improvisation when I did the, started doing composition, I, I think I was a step uh, ahead, you know, because uh, because the problem when you start teaching composition to me is uh, how do you teach uh, a musical invention that uh, can be blend uh, blended with harmony in a in a correct way, it's not easy to teach this. And I start believing that uh, you got to have some sort uh, of uh, natural inclination or uh, natural music instinct, because uh, there, I remember there were students that they didn't have it. Uh, and uh, I saw the teacher struggling, you know, <laughs> right. It, it's really, it's really almost a mystery. Um, the other thing is that uh, maybe we'll get there one day, but uh, we should implement in classical music schools also the study of improvisation very early and the study of composition also very early. You know, I think it's a mistake to wait later on. I was kind of interested when you talked about your love of Neapolitan songs. I was just curious, are you familiar with this new wave of uh, resurgence of Italian music theory from Naples, the Partimento tradition? I'm not sure. It's very new, but uh, this study where they found out in the conservatories of Naples that they had all these bass lines, and what they did was improvise on the bass lines and live counterpoint. I was just wondering if you were familiar with that. But it's 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 quite interesting. You, you you just talked about classical improvisation, and it's something we are kind of obsessed with on this show. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know that that's good. That's good. You know, I'm I'm familiar, but uh, but uh, just by by having heard about it, I didn't. But you see, uh, when I started uh, studying harmony. Uh, during my piano studies, the first uh, uh, the first thing that you were really taught, uh, beside all the basics, so the the, the triads uh, and seventh, and how you connect one chord to another in order to avoid the, the parallel fifth and parallel octaves uh, and all that sort of things that you are probably very familiar with. Then, of course, was the harmonization of a bass line. And of course, we were taught to do, to do that by sitting down at the piano with the manuscript paper and pencil. And so you had this bass line and you had to come up with the other three voices because uh, this bass line. Uh, Rosano, is that basso continuo? Yes, kind of, yeah. In, 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 in Italian, we used to call it uh, armonizzazione del basso dato. So harmonization of a given bass. That was uh, the way they called it. They are still calling it, you know. And then later on, uh, uh, we did uh, uh, the opposite, armonizzazione del canto dato. That means uh, harmonization of a given melody, you know. And that we started doing that uh, during the composition classes, but uh, that's really the. I think that's the universal foundation of music, 
the harmonization of a baseline. You know, that's uh, that's uh, I think that's really where uh, the basic mechanism, the learning of the basic mechanism of music should be learned from. You know, the harmonization of a given bass. You know, so that's a lost tradition, right? Isn't it, Rosano? I feel like. I was so amazed that I think it was like 10 years ago, I read that Bach and Chopin, Mozart, Debussy, they all did what you were talking about, being able to improvise off basses. They were all improvised. They were kind of like jazz musicians, right? That's right, man. I'm telling you, it's uh, we live in a time where, unfortunately, I have the impression that, uh, uh, you know, like, like consumism, what is old, you throw it away, yes. you know. And it's such a, such a pity, you know, because we are uh, are making the mistake of uh, cutting our memory by forgetting things of the past that prove themselves to be extremely valuable, you know. Agreed. Because of this urge that everything has got to be new, you know, in the teaching system, everything has to be... Everything has to be a revolution. And of course, revolutions are important, but we shouldn't abuse, you know, and we should be lucid enough to distinguish what is old and valuable, which elements of tradition in different fields can be still valid. I do want to tie this with jazz. Now, you bring up a very important point. I mean, I'm known in, for my podcast for Partimento, but I actually am a Berkeley graduate, and um, I want to get your opinion on this, Rosano. I, when I was in Berkeley, I studied things like chord scales and modes, and you could call it, I guess, modern jazz theory. And um, I just wanted to get your opinion. I know Barry Harris is not very fond of that sort of thing, but uh, when we talk about traditional jazz, I mean, how would you teach traditional jazz to someone who's interested in learning? And how would you contrast that? Are you familiar with the so-called modern jazz theory? And, and what's your opinion? Of course. You know, uh, uh, first of all, I have to tell you, I, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm on, I stand on the side of Barry Harris because uh, uh, I believe that there is not such a thing as a jazz harmony. <laughs> because <laughs> you know right. i th i think so because uh, even those uh, those uh, voicings uh, and chords that uh, to us they sound like jazz we can already find uh, much of that uh, of those sounds in Debussy Ravel and then the russians uh, you know later on you know in the uh, 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 I'm thinking to the well, Prokofiev, of course. Uh, uh, well, in Stravinsky, you know, there is so much of what we call jazz harmony that is really taken from uh, from those composers. Yeah, so, I think Barry Harris's famous line, as he says, is jazz is kind of a continu or bebop or jazz is a continuation of classical music. That's right. Jazz is a continu because he says that uh, his theory and uh, and his uh, 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 the, there is some 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 truth some truth in that that uh, you know when uh, in the classical music they stopped improvising then all of a sudden jazz was uh, getting around so it's almost like uh, Barry says you can't stop improvisation you know so it's almost like the the collective mind of humanity needs uh, that escape valve that is improvisation. So once they started with once they stopped with classical music, all of a sudden jazz came around and we got an incredible output of improvisation, probably like never before. I'm tempted to say, you know, <laughs> because think of all these uh, great jazz musicians uh, in more than a hundred years, what they made up, and of course we can relate only to the recorded material, but uh, we are talking about thousands of musicians playing gigs uh, everywhere and improvising every night, you know, think about that. 
you know and so going back uh, to to the the jazz harmony and classical harmony, I believe they are the same thing, you know. It's uh, it's only that uh, with jazz, uh, you take some elements uh, from, from really the classical music uh, all the way to the 1900s, uh, and then you turn it into a practical way to use it. And the example is, for example, Errol Garner, you know, that... Uh, uh, Errol that couldn't read music, but he could hear everything. So he would play uh, Laura, you know, the beautiful song, yep. the beautiful ballad. But of course, uh, you'd hear shades of uh, Debussy and Ravel all the way through, you know. So that's, uh, and this, uh, this remark is made already by Schoenberg, in the introduction of his uh, of his book he says uh, that's what he says that uh, the the classical composers the great composers come up with stuff and then it's a so absorbed into popular music i do not agree completely but uh, this is true but it can be also the other way around because we have seen later on again in the 1900s but also in the music of chopin for example that the classical composer assimilates in his music some popular right right that's ele right. elements so both things uh, are are true in the case uh, of jazz though harmonically speaking I think is more prevalent the the borrowing from uh, from the classical. I think I, I I'm tempted to say so. I might be wrong, you know, but this would be a great subject uh, for uh, to study, you know, and see, you know, like studying several uh, jazz musicians uh, and see where are their roots in classical music and if there are roots in classical music with their harmonic vocabulary and then vice versa to see which classical uh, uh, we, we know already that uh, that uh, ravel probably was listening to some early jazz you know and uh, yeah and so and, and probably gershwin the, as well yeah and gershwin of course so I, I think the, all this is a very, very uh, interesting uh, topic if you are a very uh, passionate uh, scholar in, in, in this discipline, you know, in harmony, in jazz and classical, and see the waves of material, how they shift from one way to the other. I, I'm, of course, I'm very biased due to Parlamento towards something like figured bass but i was quite shocked i remember i bought barry harris's uh, dvd his workshop dvd and there's a little line that he says in the dvd where he said where he's trying to describe his method of harmony and he says well essentially what i'm doing is figured bass and we need to find one of those old teachers who they say are too old but that's the one we really need to find because this is what this is is figured bass yeah yeah i, b I believe in that and the uh, you know, when, uh, when you play, as a piano player, when you play the, the chord structure of a tune, and, uh, you know, because uh, very early I developed the ability to play in a band uh, without the bass. So with the stride in the left hand and the walking bass, practically very often you don't need a bass player <laughs> you see so so uh, i got more and more into the temptation i don't do it all the time but i do it very often that when you play a bass line with the left hand then you start getting into the mode of trying to harmonize every note of the bass line you know 
and that makes uh, an incredible, how can I say, an incredible sound because you start getting, you know, if I play, uh, let's see if I can do this. Let's, uh, let's consider just uh, a, a 12 bar blues in F. So. But so you, you see what uh, what I mean by uh, and so I relate to what uh, to what Barry says, you know, because uh, we jazz piano players sometimes forget that uh, what you play becomes very interesting if you start stop thinking of chords uh, in a vertical way but you start really looking into an, an horizontal way and you start applying the so-called voice leading you see and the to do that uh, while you are accompany a soloist uh, i think it makes it beautiful and very interesting rather than just uh, concentrate uh, on uh, stacks of notes uh, that might sound exotic and uh, and nice, but mix the things up, you know? If you throw in a little bit of counterpoint, uh, th that's good, you know, that's smart. Can I ask you, Rosano, specifically, technically, Okay, so um, if you take if you're walking, what can you give an, a theoretical explanation for this horizontal contrapuntal thinking? So, are you thinking of inverting your chord, or are you thinking of diminished chords in between the chords? How are you? Uh, can you give a technical description of what you are doing horizontally? Uh, well, you know, for example, uh, uh, in this uh, in this case. I'll tell you, very simple. The first three notes of the bass line that, uh, that I played were F, G, and A. And so F, G, and A, I can harmonize that with uh, adding just two parts on top. So I have uh, E flat and A on the F, so F7. And then on the G, I move those two parts to E natural and B flat. And then on the A, the E goes back to e, e flat and the B flat goes up to C. You see, so you, you really look, you try as much as you can to look at each note as a separate voice. And you try to connect the, one note to each other in the smoothest way, you know, without too many jumps, in other, in other words. And this is, exa this is exactly what we were taught, uh, you know, uh, in the harmonizzazione del basso dato, harmonization of a given bass. But of course, when you sit down with music and paper and you have the, all the time, uh, you have one hour, you know, then uh, you can uh, also make sure that there are not parallel fifths. But uh, the, the thing of the parallel fifth and parallel octaves is something that you need to learn to avoid. But then in practical, in practical playing, you just do it when, when it happens. You know, it's not... Uh, the, 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 you learn the rules, uh, and then after you learn the rules, then you are allowed to break them. Let me ask you a question. If somebody is, because the way jazz education is very popular now on the online, it's very much aligned with the modern music, modern jazz theories. How, if somebody is kind of familiar with that, what can you tell them that is different about the way you think of harmony and, and chords and jazz edu and the way you teach jazz? Maybe what is different from what you're teaching compared to what they're used to? Well, I think that, uh, uh, again, like Barry, Barry says, uh, I, I base my, my approach to improvisation and theory 
to the major and minor scales. That's it. And I see everything else as a consequence of that. You know, so I don't drive myself crazy <laughs> into looking at each chord uh, and see which mode applies uh, to that chord, you know. Uh, even though there is uh, uh, the method, I don't think the method is wrong of the modes. Actually, it, it goes back uh, to, to medieval times, you know, when music was, uh, there wasn't yet the supremacy of the major scale that was one of the modes and the minor scale, but uh, it, it was different, you know, it was, uh, it, it was through the century, uh, centuries of evolution of music that uh, somehow the modes uh, went to fade uh, and uh, there was the affirmation of the tonal system based on the major scale, you know, this was a process that took centuries. So when, uh, when uh, in the jazz studies they want to bring you back to the consideration of modes, uh, it makes sense. I'm not saying that is, uh, is uh, but I think for the kind of jazz uh, that I play, that is tonal jazz, swinging tonal jazz, you only need to know uh, uh, the, the tonal system applied to the major and minor scales with the all the universe uh, of movements uh, and chords that that implies because it's a universe there is so much just in that one thing I, i've noticed in galant or 18th century music is that the the key changes quite a bit from bar to bar and it's, it's in some ways it's very similar to jazz if you take a song like all the things you are there's a quite a number of yes. key changes so i want to ask you rosano um when you look at a jazz standard like maybe all the things you are are you thinking chord to chord? Or are you thinking several bars at a time? Are you thinking key to key? How do you, when you are improvising, what is your mind thinking like? I'm sorry if this is too technical. You probably don't even think like no, this, yeah. right? <laughs> well, but, uh, you know, it gets to a point when you're very familiar with the tune and when you, you are experienced musicians that really the thinking, it feels like the thinking is minimal, you know, but I can go back and, and tell you, you know, when I started to improvise how I was thinking. And in my case, I think I was, I was thinking from chord to chord, you know, from chord to chord. And then it takes a while to, to start realizing that you can, you can think to chord to chord, but then uh, just uh, look at it in the context of, uh, of the key that you're playing in. So like maybe rhythm changes that, uh, let's say rhythm changes in B flat, are you thinking just in B flat for the A section? Well, that's, uh, that's, uh, it can be done both ways. And we've discussed this very much with Barry and there is uh, lots of literature that means recording of jazz musicians doing it both ways like you you'll hear uh, you can play rhythm change and real really dig out every single chord you know and on the other end you can hear uh, uh, combos where you have the rhythm section that comes going through the chords but then the soloist is just swinging <laughs> on on B flat, you know, and it works. It, it works. What is your preference, you Rosano? Know? I like them both because uh, because uh, if you if I find myself wanting really to groove, you know, to swing to groove, uh, then uh, I, I I might stay on B flat, you know. But uh, if I find myself, uh, uh, how can I say, trying to be more elaborate, then uh, then uh, I'll go through all the chords and maybe apply some substitutions, you know. And uh, of course, then we bring in the subject of uh, chord substitutions, and that's another universe of <laughs> possibilities. 
and colors because that's what they are substitutions are colors different colors that all of a sudden the music uh, the, the music starts sounding exotic like one melody note you know like for example i i always uh, tell my students you know if you have a, in, in, in a certain melody let's say you have a c7 and the melody is holding a b flat on a c7 of course you can play a c7 but you could play a a tenth in the left hand the c and e natural and then on top you could stack a g flat triad with the b flat on top and all of a sudden you have this and that's a, an amazing different color do you think of it as a g flat entity on top of a c7 is that the way your mind would think of that i i uh, you know th that's a that's a, a way to simplify it but actually uh, if you want to describe that chord then you call it uh, a c7 with the flat 9 and the flat 5th for you practically how does your mind work when you when you do these concepts not when you're teaching but you know, when you're my, actually doing it uh, uh, it starts uh, it started by codifying precisely flat 9 and flat and with experience, uh, I came to realize that uh, you can just think of uh, a, the Triton apart triad stacked on top of the of the sea, you know. So uh, here it is one more time. I, I said that before. There is always, uh, in my case, uh, the codification first uh, that turns uh, into a practical use later and not vice versa, in my case, you see. And uh, I think that's, a, that's a, an important observation of my way of proceeding, you know. But it could be the other way around, because uh, I believe that, uh, for example, going back to Errol Garner, some of these uh, incredibly sophisticated chords uh, that he played, he just heard them and played them. But I'm not sure if he, if he really knew all the theory behind it. But he, I have the feeling that this is because of his in, uh, genius. You know, let's remember that, uh, that uh, Errol Garner, uh, well, this is what is in his biography said, that by the age of three, he could sit at the piano and reproduce <laughs> practically any melody that he could hear. <laughs> so... So I'm sure, and you see, Errol Garner's routine, the practicing routine, was going to the record shop and buy all a bunch of records, classical music, jazz, pop, everything. And he would come home with this stack of LPs, or 78 or whatever, and then start listening to them. And uh, while the turntable was going and playing music, he would be smoking cigarettes <laughs> and pacing back and forth in the room, you know. Yeah. And then suddenly he would stop and get to the piano and play. So it's like uh, his brain was uh, 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 feeding itself uh, with all these sounds and harmonies and styles uh, and uh, melodies. Uh, until he felt that he had got the conception of a certain tune in his mind, and then he would stop the recorder, get, go to the piano and play. So I don't think there was much codification, but there was uh, probably this incredible capability of absorbing those sounds uh, and those uh, stacks of sound and then playing them just like that. You know, they say that once he went to a classical recital of uh, Emil Gillels, the famous Russian piano player, and then with some friends, and then they went home, and, and he just by memory of what he heard at the concert, he played some, some passages of some of the Beethoven sonatas that Gillels had performed, you know. 
So that's the kind of mind that we are talking about, you know, not a common mind for sure. <laughs> um, I want to turn to improvisation, and I have always tried to figure out pedagogy and figure out how people think when they improvise. And the, the one way that I like to think about it now is um, not so much scale-wise, although that's very popular. When I look at some of these old Partimento diminution treatises, it's for me, it makes more sense when you take a vertical figure and put put it horizontally and then insert the passing notes. And then it kind of is maybe like a scale, but I think of it more as a horizontal chord rather than a scale. But yeah. I, I would like to know how you think of improvising and how does your mind work? Do you, because I know Barry Harris talks about scales, but um, but other people talk about chord scales. Some people think about modes. Some people just think of the chord symbol itself and then they horizontalize the chord symbol and put in passing yeah. notes and approach notes and that sort of thing like a bass player yeah. does. So, uh, Rosano, how do yeah. you think about improvisation? What is kind of your conception? Well, you, dis you just described it all. It's all of what you said, really. But uh, once again, once again, I can go back and telling you uh, for the students that might be listening to this uh, or for those who wants to start to approach improvisation. When I started, I remember clearly that uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, there were certain notes that didn't sound good and certain notes that sounded very good. And so I noticed that uh, if would, I would improvise uh, by using the tones uh, of the chords uh, and of course uh, making melodies based on those uh, uh, tones uh, with a certain rhythm then the phrase would be always uh, correct mm. you know so it might sound uh, uh, simplistic but uh, oh no no but uh, if you're going to start improvising, you got to make sure that you know exactly the notes that make each chord. You know, you cannot be hesitating when you see a G flat seven. Oh, what are the notes of that chord? Right. You cannot be doing that, right. you know. So the, 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 the first study that you got to make, you got to know without thinking all the major and minor scales, and all, the, and all the chord symbols and their inversions with both hands. Right. And this is very plain and simple. Now, there is a, another element that uh, we forget to talk about. That is the fact that jazz uh, is uh, really a oral music. Yes. You know, something that, uh, that first starts in your ear. You know, so uh, I don't believe that you can uh, can learn jazz improvisation without uh, a solid habit of listening to music constantly and loving to listen to music constantly to jazz, because that's how you create a reference. If you don't have a reference in your mind, then it becomes impossible to create a phrase. Uh, and have that phrase make sense. So it's the same exact thing as a, a spoken language, you know. Right. So you see, we are talking to each other now, and we are telling each other things that were not prepared. You know, this is like an improvisation. But each single word of our conversation is a is, is a word, is something that is recognized, commonly recognized by people, you know? And it's the combination of these words uh, that will make the speech, uh, and it's sp every speech is different from each other. And so it works the same way in improvisation. The way you build your vocabulary for improvisation is, to, is by listening to lots of music, constantly being surrounded by jazz, by a certain kind of jazz, if you prefer one style rather than the other. But that's how you create the reference, and that's how you can turn the arpeggio of a chord into a jazzy-sounding phrase. 
because otherwise uh, it will stay an arpeggio of a chord. You know, it won't be a phrase. So a phrase is uh, is made of notes, but it's made also of uh, pronunciation, accents, the right intention into syncopation. So there are also these elements to be taken in consideration that you can apply if you have a clear reference in your mind of how the music is supposed to sound. I, I hope I'm clear oh, with that. Absolutely, it's fantastic. And I wanted to, just for people or people to get this perspective, have you transcribed a lot of solos or do you pick parts of solos that you like and kind of compile a vocabulary that way? Or do you learn like the whole solo? No, I, I think the only transcription that I made all the way through two years ago was a, a handful of keys, uh, the Fats Waller recording, ah. you know, because I had to perform it uh, at a concert uh, and I thought, you know, I want to try to get as uh, close as possible to, yeah. to the Fats Waller recording. And so I transcribed it and then... Uh, and then after I learned the transcription, I decided which parts I was going to play like fats and which parts uh, were going to be improvised, yeah. uh, you know. And I think this is an excellent study that, uh, that you can make. But that was the only, only time that I did such a work. Uh, the, the kind of transcribing that I do these days is mostly uh, when I want to learn a new song and I fall in love with a certain interpretation of that tune. So it might be either an Ang Jones version or a Tommy Flanagan. And, uh, and so I transcribe uh, the melody, the way they play it uh, and their uh, harmonization. But then still uh, I will decide if I'm going to use all of that uh, or I will integrate that with some of my own, you know. And I, I think this is a great way to to learn tunes, you know, learn tunes by transcribing. Regarding transcribing solos, I think uh, that's uh, also a very helpful tune, uh, a tool if you have the patience and the passion to do it. I never had the patience to to go through the transcription over all solos. I I believed mostly in trying to understand the phrasing and the pronunciation of a certain musician. Pronunciation, I mean the articulation of eight notes. Basically, that's what it is, you know, and trying to, to imitate. Like there is, there are very distinctive ways of playing eight notes. Uh, and you, you can hear the difference, like, for example, if you put on a, 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 an early Hank Jones record, or if you listen to an early George Shearing record compared to the way uh, 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 Tommy Flanagan or Barry Harris uh, articulated eight notes, you realize that there is a difference. And the difference, I came to the conclusion, is mostly in the space that you leave between the notes, you know? Uh, that, that's really something, uh, you know, the, the space that you leave between the notes, even when you articulate eight notes uh, in a, a, a medium fast tempo, you can decide to play very legato or, uh, or staccato or something in between. And that will make the articulation sound completely different, you know. There are some uh, Hank Jones records or early George Shearing records where each eight notes, each eight note sounds uh, very distinct, uh, like a very distinct entity. It's not staccato, but it's something in between. And, uh, and that blended with that beautiful uh, touch, ringing touch that they, those piano players had. That also, you know, always make me think of uh, uh, drops of water, you know, <laughs> yeah. falling down. You know, right. I can't think of any other um, 
image <laughs> to describe uh, that way of playing the piano. Maybe it's, it's very beautiful. And so, and so I think it makes sense for someone that wants to study jazz piano very seriously to consider these ways of touch and these ways of articulation. You know, it's many ways and each one is a wonderful world in itself, you know. So th there is really so much to take in co into consideration, you know. But uh, one, I'm going to say that one more. Yes. If you are motivated by the love of the music and a strong passion and the, and the, and the strong desire to learn, you'll find yourself absorbing all of this uh, really in a natural way, you know. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I live with my, uh, if you would be here with me, you'll see there is the, the, the upright piano and right beside the piano, there is the computer, you know, and the computer is one of those uh, with also the, the, you can still put a CD on, you know, <laughs> and so that's, uh, that's how I work. So I either listen to a CD and then, uh, you know, I practice, I practice a lot playing along with records, you know, the, again, now we forgot uh, of this wonderful possibility, you know, but uh, Barry always talks about uh, that uh, he used to have uh, a, a turntable with the adjustable speed. And so there was the way to change the speed of the record all the way to half the speed. Yeah. And so if you put on a record and change the speed to half, then the music would sound uh, uh, half as low and the pitch would be an octave lower. And so he said that's what he did when he wanted to learn some of the Charlie Parker phrases or he really wanted to understand in some spots what Bud Powell was doing. That's what he did, you know, <laughs> Fantastic. and we shouldn't forget. Yeah. yeah, We shouldn't forget this approach. You know, sometimes I put on a Bud Powell record and I play along. And uh, by the end of it, if, if you know all the tunes and you can go through the old record, that, I don't know, the old CD that, might be 45, 50 minutes of music or more, then you can see that uh, something got stuck in, stuck in yourself. You <laughs> yeah. sound a little bit better, <laughs> right. you know? And if you do this day after day, day after day, uh, year after year, that's uh, how the, the authenticity of music starts to penetrate your DNA. Uh, Rosano, let me jump in and let me ask you some simple questions that I'd love to get your opinion on this. So the first one is, what's your advice to playing fast, up-tempo tunes? Yeah, that's uh, you got to start slow. You got to start slow and little by little get to, to that tempo that uh, is, uh, is borderline between what is comfortable for you and what becomes uncomfortable. You use the metronome. I believe in the use of the metronome and, uh, and push it further to the point that uh, your phrasing starts to get chopped up, but push it further. And then after a while, maybe you practice like that 15 minutes, then after a while you bring it back to the comfortable zone and you'll find yourself that the comfortable zone is even more comfortable. <laughs> right. And then you start pushing it up again. And, you know, I used to have some uh, very drastic uh, tempo increases. And it's a struggle. But you try as much as you can to live with that struggle. And uh, here again, by doing it, uh, you'll find yourself that you'll have to relax. You'll have to economize uh, if such a word exists in English <laughs> yeah, yeah, so does. to, to y y your touch you know so 
stay close to the keys, breathe, uh, take uh, rests between phrases, because it's, even if you're playing fast, doesn't mean that you have to play eight notes all the way through, you know, like crazy. No, you still have to breathe and still uh, every phrase should be a separate entity that makes sense with each other in a consequential way, you know. Uh, but that's that's really what it is, you know. I, As a matter of fact, the other day, the other day I was trying again. So I started with the the metronome put on the half note at uh, 160, and it felt comfortable. And so I pushed it to 180, and it was not so comfortable anymore. So I pushed it down to 200, very fast, very uncomfortable, and then back to 160. All of a sudden. 160 felt way more comfortable. And, and that's what you gotta do. That's what you gotta do. There is no escape, but just by, by trying and finding that balance uh, so that the articulation and the thinking start working together in an harmonic way rather than fighting each other. There's something unbelievable about your uh, musicianship, which is I noticed that you cited as an influence Dave McKenna. And, yes. and there's one thing that I just I love when a pianist who can do this, and it's very, very rare, and you're one of them, is you have a walking bass line and you have a running right hand at the same time improvising. And it just seems yeah. like you're, I mean, do you, how many sides of your brain are you using? And uh, I want to understand, step. how did you develop that incredible ability? Yeah, this is, this is also a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, learning experience. You see, uh, I started, uh, uh, when I started studying walking bass line, I was maybe 15, 16 years old. And uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, I could uh, walk bass lines without putting too much thinking just by using the major and minor triad or the arpeggio of the chord, in other words, in the left hand, you know. So this way you would have your left hand playing always the right notes with a 4-4 four -four rhythm, four beats a bar, and still being able to concentrate on the phrasing of the right hand. And then, uh, of course, uh, you mentioned that before, I started realizing that in between those uh, uh, triads, uh, I could add passing tones, you know. And so I started pr practicing bass lines uh, with the as many passing tones I could use <laughs> so that uh, there would be no intervals. Uh, not, I wouldn't use very much intervals uh, more than uh, a whole step, you know? And, uh, and I found myself that uh, uh, little by little that became very comfortable. And you see, comfortable with piano playing means uh, that uh, you can do that uh, once again, I'm saying this, having the impression that you don't put much uh, thinking effort in it. And so th that leaves space again uh, to elaborate your inventions uh, in the right end. And that's how it proceeded, you know. Uh, there is also a way, because you see, I think it's very hard uh, to to improvise uh, new stuff, uh, new lines with both ends in the same time. So it has to be like uh, you can uh, you can go crazy with the bass line if if you are playing some comfortable stuff in the right end and vice versa. And by saying comfortable means uh, that you are applying a vocabulary that uh, that is known to yourself because uh, 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 if you try to venture yourself in phrases in the right hand uh, that, that are uh, uh, 
out, you know, then your attention gets switched to that. Uh, and of course, uh, the left hand uh, might uh, uh, go into territories that are more comfortable. So there is also all that, you know. So it might sound like uh, it's uh, there is complete independence, uh, but uh, I think a lot of that is a myth, you know. You just, uh, you just find ways uh, to make it sound good. Uh, but I mean, isn't improvisation yeah. just a lot of memorization of small pieces? And it is improvisation yeah. because you are drawing from what you've uh, yeah. amassed. So it really is improvisation. Well, you know, it's, uh, it, it depends how you look at it. You know, it depends how you look at it. But, uh, but you see, Dave McKenna, he went a step further because he used to be called the, the three-ended piano player. <laughs> right. Because uh, with Dave, you really hear the bass line and the melody, but then you hear also chords, uh, very distinct chords in between. And so, and the amazing thing is that uh, he makes those, uh, that bass, that melody and those chords, he makes them sound in a distinct way. So almost like uh, I have the impression, like those parts were overdubbed, you know, <laughs> like you first, you know, yeah. it's very impressive, yeah. very impressive. And in recent years after they've passed away, now on YouTube, you find more and more videos. And it's amazing, like if you, if you just, when I used to listen to him, I thought uh, that he would be jumping all over the keyboard. But then now that we have the possibility to watch what he was doing, he, there, there is very little movement, you know, man, it's impressive, impressive with very little movement and uh, a almost, uh, almost no pedal, you know, like he would create all of that uh, with this, uh, uh, just with his fingers, you know, and with a very economical, once, once more, very economical movement of the fingers, you know. I mean, a, a, a real genius of piano that uh, didn't get wider recognition. I mean, among certain musicians, uh, uh, is considered like a go like a god, you know. But uh, I I don't know how how well known uh, Dave is to the general public, you know. Here's another question: Do you hum or sing, either externally or internally, when you improvise? Yes, a lot, a lot, and sometimes you can hear it, you know. And it gets a little bit in the way, you know. It's like uh, more than a singing, it becomes a grunting some sometimes, you know. But uh, yeah, it seems like uh, uh, at times you cannot fully play your your potential if you don't get engaged in that uh, in that uh, humming or uh, whatever you want to call it. You know, very, very, very weird. You know, there, there are musicians that they were very famous for doing that Bud very Powell. loud. Yep. You know, but Powell and uh, and uh, Harold Garner did it very, very loud, and uh, Oscar Peterson did it. You know, the grunting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right. Yeah. Okay, so um, I mean, uh, it's been really what an honor. I wanted to ask you a couple of fun questions now, just to end off. It's nice to end on a light, uh, lighter note. And so, one question I wanted to ask you was, if you could play with any jazz musician in history, who would you play with, and why? Oh my, that's hard because <laughs> there are so many. Yeah, it becomes very hard to pick one. <laughs> To pick one, it becomes very hard. Yep. Maybe, yeah, it's very hard. It seems <laughs> like if I mention one... I'll give me three, then. then it's like, I'll make it le slightly less harder. Let's see. I would say Louis Armstrong. Okay. Art Tatum, even though, you know... Uh, uh, but I, I would have just loved to be able to be near Art Tatum, yep. you know. I would say Louis Armstrong, Art Tatum... And Charlie Parker. Mm, wonderful. Let's, let's put it that way. 
Yeah. What is your proudest musical moment? Oh, wow. My proudest musical moment. Mm. Uh, even, even in this case, uh, there, are, there are quite a few. But you should, I might mention one particularly. Okay. That, uh, that you see, my father, that is, uh, my parents, you see, are still relatively young. You know, they are in their mid 70s. But uh, my father very hardly gave me a compliment. Uh, uh, with what I was doing with the music. I mean, he supported, my parents supported, supported what I wanted to do all the way through. You know, even maybe sometimes they wouldn't agree, but uh, eventually they supported my choices. But my father was very difficult that he would give me a compliment, you know. And I believe that's also the reason why I always try to get better within my possibilities, you know, in a very humble way. Uh, but then when I did my final graduation in classical piano, he came to hear the, the, the graduation, as I told you, was just a recital in front of a panel of teachers. And, 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 and those recitals were open to the public, so people could come and hear. Of course, my father came and uh, the, the performance went well. The teachers seemed to be happy. So I remember when uh, uh, we left the room, then uh, he gave me a hug with a couple of tears, you know. And so I think that was uh, meant uh, a lot. Okay, so here's let me ask you another one. This is this might be fun for people who, I mean, you you do some incredible things. But what is the hardest tune for you to play? Do you have a tune that is difficult? Uh, well, there are many, there are many. But for example, for many years, uh, I I avoided to play Lush Life, you know, because I saw it uh, like uh, something that. Uh, only a few can touch uh, and make sense out of it and make it beautiful, you know. It took, it took year, years before, before I started feeling comfortable with, uh, with that song, uh, you know. And, uh, yeah, I would say Lush Life. You see, I believe also in the fact that uh, uh, you become uh, an accomplished uh, uh, Part of being an accomplished mu musician is also the ability to effortlessly transpose. And I always looked uh, at Lush Life as a tune that uh, if you can transpose the verse and chorus uh, of that one, uh, then uh, you are uh, on, the, on a good path, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Final thing is... Here's my final question, Rosanna. Thank you. You've been such an incredible guest. You have recorded many albums. If someone wanted to be introduced to the music of Rosanna Sportiello, what three albums would you recommend? I would recommend the, the newest one because uh, the newest one that just came, came out uh, six months ago, about six months ago, that's right. It's called That's It on the uh, Arbor's Records uh, label you know i think this album it's really reflects my maturity i think i was able with these uh, if i remember well 17 tracks uh, to put uh, all that i am pianistically in a jazzy way you know, it's all there. You know, I'm very, very satisfied with that. And also for the first time, there are, I think, five original compositions of mine, you know. So I think that album will give uh, the idea really of who I am pianistically and from the jazz point of view. 
And before of that, before that, uh, I would say Pastel, that is another piano solo that I did a few years back. So, and uh, as uh, as uh, a sideman, I did several recordings with the, the tenor saxophone player Harry Allen. And so those are also good for those who are interested in uh, the way to comp behind uh, within a band uh, in a rhythm section behind the soloist. So those are uh, I think those are good, you know. But uh, I said once again to uh, for someone that never heard me, I think the last record is a, is a, is the the best introduction fantastic let's put it that way wonderful well what can i say i mean it's been a real privilege to speak with you today rosano i'm a huge fan and please can you tell my audience what you have planned for the rest of the year and how they can contact you to buy your music subscribe please subscribe to this man's youtube channel it's unbelievable and you can also contact him for private lessons how can they reach out to you and please tell my audience what you have planned well, uh, still the 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 traveling and performing because of the of the coronavirus uh, is still shaky a little bit. But uh, about uh, uh, seven, eight months ago, I started live streaming from home, and I've been doing a show that is called Live at the Flat in Greenwich Village. So all these live streams, they're all available to, to watch on my website, rosanosportiello.com. And uh, also through the website, you can contact me if you want lessons or for anything else, rosanosportiello.com. So if you want, you can subscribe to my YouTube uh, channel or uh, you can put uh, a follow or a like to my facebook page the streams also always uh, are streamed both on youtube and facebook so you can do all of this if you want <laughs> <laughs> well i mean thank you so much rosano i hope you had a good time on the nikhil hogan show let's chat again soon in the future bye bye it was wonderful and thank you so much